Thanks, Cecilia. I appreciate that. That that was kind uh, as well. Um, it's truth. It, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So this is all very humbling for me. Uh, but um, again, like I, I think the type of teachers that would show up in the middle of December uh, for a session like this are probably already pretty motivated teachers as already. So maybe I'll just share a few thoughts. Um, that I hopefully will be beneficial maybe going into the new year as we think about you know, setting goals, how we want to improve and uh, along those lines. So um, I guess my, my thoughts will really be about around three concepts. One, uh, teachers as leaders, which is based uh, on this article, like, like I mentioned before, that was uh, that I wrote for um, uh, a kind of an internal teaching and learning uh, platform that we have at HKU. And so I put that link in the chat just in case it's useful to anybody. So I'll talk briefly about teachers and leaders, um, how we can have a more of a preparation mindset, um, particularly in the midst of this volatility, um, how we can engage students. And then I'll, I'll open it up for uh, hopefully a robust uh, q and I'm, I'm happy to discuss this and I don't plan on talking for too long. Um, but again, just talking about teachers as leaders, about having a preparation mindset, and then how, how can we encourage engagement? Uh, as Cecilia mentioned, I teach across a wide range of course sizes and programs, as well as disciplines. And as a result, I've had large lectures, I've had small seminars, uh, I teach undergrad students, I, te I teach executives. And so um, uniformly, a lot of my teaching experience is always kind of being informed by these different experiences. And so I'll, I'll take something I learned teaching a small group of executives and try to apply it into an undergrad class and, and vice versa. I think if we all look back and think back 12 months ago, our view of the world was probably pretty different than it is today. And so I think first, you know, I just want to praise all of you teachers who are on this call and all of you uh, kind of education professionals that are on this call for, um, you know, executing through a very tumultuous year. And I think that's a real credit to everybody's professionalism through protests, through pandemic, um, you know, kind of going from traditional face-to-face -face teaching to hybrid teaching to online teaching back to, you know, whatever it is. And um, so I just feel it's a real credit to everybody's professionalism that um, we were all able to do this so well at, at a high level. Um, in, in So if I jump into this idea of teachers as leaders, maybe I'll start with an acronym. Uh, there's an acronym that some of you have probably heard or read. It, it, it's been used a lot the last few months. And it's called VUCA, V-U-C-A. And um, maybe I will, let me just type that into the chat so everybody knows what V-U-C-A. Um, so what does that stand for? What does that acronym, acronym stand for? So VUCA stands for, V is for volatility, U is for uncertainty, C is for complexity, and A is for ambiguity. And in, in a lot of places, this has been the, the acronym that has described the last 12 months for a lot of folks. It's very volatile, uncertain, complex, and very ambiguous. Now, um, this, this acronym, this term, this phrase, uh, wasn't actually uh, used initially by business people, though business people like to use it. Uh, where it actually started was um, at the end of the Cold War. In the late 1980s, the U United States Army War College was looking out at the world and realized that, hey, for the last half century, uh, they had an enemy in communism in the Soviet Union in this Cold War. And as the Berlin Wall fell, they realized the strategic landscape was changing. And they didn't realize how, they, didn't, they weren't sure how to navigate that. And as they thought about that, they coined this term VUCA. Uh, subsequently, uh, people thought it was sounded really interesting, and so it got taken into business um, vocabulary, business jargon. Even prior to the pandemic, I was talking to a lot of companies. I would come in and give a talk or a seminar about, hey, how do we manage or lead in periods of volatility? And what I would normally share, you know, we would talk about this VUCA concept. And then I would talk about uh, how, do you, how do you then be a leader in volatility? And I would talk about uh, a leadership model called agile leadership or leadership agility. And I'm not going to talk about it too much here, but at the heart of, as I, would, as I would talk about this with different companies, what I increasingly realized, it wasn't just business leaders who should have this agile leader, leadership mindset. Um, 
teachers were leaders. Teachers should have an agile leadership mindset too. And increasingly, that's um, what I felt both um, during the protest as well as during the pandemic. And um, and I feel like this leadership mindset can really help a lot of us in how we frame what we do both in and outside the classroom to support our students' learning. But if we just look at this really basically, um, there are different types of leaders in this scheme. And I'm not going to go through it all because it gets more complicated than this, but this is a really uh, quick and dirty version of it. Um, most people that have accomplished something do it because they're experts or achievers. And ultimately, that's a heroic type of leadership because it's about them. Uh, but to become a really enlightened leader, a leader that a leader that does very transformational things, you have to be a catalyst. And what does that mean? Experts and achievers, it's an individual activity. For a catalyst, it's a group activity. It's an institutional activity. And why is that distinction important? Well, for experts and achievers, you want to be the hero. For catalysts, the idea is, hey, I want to serve the institution. I want to help my team. Um, and, and that's a very different perspective. For most of us that are academics, it's been all about this heroic type of approach. Why? Because if you do well in school, you're really smart. You get really good grades, you get a fancy degree. Um, so for a lot of academics, uh, even though we don't realize it, we're oftentimes in this heroic mode of leadership where it's all about us, what we've accomplished. When you move into a post-heroic leadership kind of mentality, it's about what do we as a group accomplish? And when we take that mindset into the classroom, it's no longer about the lecturer who's in front of the students say, hey, I'm so smart, listen to me. For a catalyst type of teacher or post-heroic leadership type of teacher. It's about, hey, collectively, what can we do? What can we accomplish together? And when you do that, it becomes a very inclusive environment. Now, to accomplish this, they have these leadership agility competencies. I'm not going to go through all of these, but basically, these are skills that leaders are supposed to develop. But really, at the heart of it is two things, reflection and communication. Reflection in terms of how, how can I be better? How can I get feedback? How can I improve? not uh, resting on your laurels, and then feedback or and communication being, hey, how can I communicate clearly the principles that I believe or the concepts I want to teach in a course? And um, between the reflection and the communication, you end up really enhancing your leadership ability. Now, um, how, how does this all play in into a classroom? I think in particular, it, what the last 12 to 18 months has shown many of us in Hong Kong that teach university age students is that our classrooms are not immune from the volatility of the world. We used to think that, I think a lot of us implicitly thought that the university is some kind of refuge from what's going on in the real world. We're one or two or multiple degrees removed from what's happening in the real world. I think what the events of the last 18 months have shown us in a very dramatic way is that we're not. Our classrooms are the real world our universities, our campuses are the real world, and we need to have a broader mindset uh, to be able to serve our students in a more effective way. And uh, this is where that leadership agility um, kind of identity is really important, I think, for teachers, that teachers view themselves as leaders for their students in the sense that we are, we provide good examples to them in terms of curiosity, enthusiasm for learning, stability, all of these things, irrespective of discipline that we can always demonstrate um, through how we teach, right? And I think that can still continue to have a profound influence on students in, in many ways. So to build on this idea of teachers as leaders uh, is I'll move maybe into this kind of what I, what I term as a preparation mindset. And maybe I'll just share a few things that I've uh, kind of uh, figured out uh, over the last 18 months or so. I'm sure many of you have felt the same way. Uh, a lot of this experience has been informed by what Cecilia mentioned. So beyond the different courses I teach, I also teach an online course. I had a number of teaching development grants that related to developing different types of multimedia tools or technology to support teaching. And so I was really lucky in some sense that I was already doing various practices related to that would be helpful for online teaching or hybrid teaching prior to us having to do it. Um, so I maybe had a little bit of a head start, but um, so based on those experiences, maybe I'll just share a few things that I found to be helpful. 
One, I think all of us have learned that to teach in a hybrid or a uh, online only format effectively requires more detailed teaching plans. Like we have to prepare much more stringently and in a disciplined way to teach effectively online. Now, if you don't really want to be disciplined and you don't really care too much, then you can just do it like you normally would do. But the fact that we're in some situations asynchronous um, and in almost all situations, we're in, a, in a, a medium where we cannot get direct human feedback through a body language or cues, and we don't even know if the students are actually there and listening and paying attention. Um, I think that requires much more detailed teaching uh, plans and preparation uh, than we normally would when if we could just walk into a classroom that is full of students. Now, um, so in my own situation, we know from uh, different education studies and psychology that you know human attention span is pretty limited. Depending on what you look at, it could be six to twelve minutes, give or take, uh, you know, a few minutes on either side. So I, I plan, me personally, um, I usually plan in ten minute teaching increments, meaning most of what I do is planned in ten minutes. And um, ideally, every five to ten minutes, I'm doing some different form of teaching. So, for example, um, I could start off the class. I'm not much of a lecturer, uh, but like I could start off the class for five or 10 minutes and lecture about a few principles. And then after that, for the next five or 10 minutes, uh, we may do an online quiz, like question via a, a, a polling software. And then after that, we may end up doing a, a case discussion. Now, case discussions are nice, and I, I was heavily influenced by case discussions when I was in graduate school, so I used them quite a bit. But case discussions are nice because within the case, you can teach principles, but every time there's a new question or a concept, you're resetting the attention span of the student, right? So, and oftentimes, if you're doing a case very well, the teacher is not speaking very much. The teacher is only conducting or guiding the class discussion. So, if we talk about concept A, I'll say, so Haley, I see Haley's still here. She's not falling asleep yet. I'll say, Miss Lau, hey, what do you think about this? And we'll give her a question, right? Within that, that resets everybody's attention span because now they know, hey, somebody else besides the teacher speaking, and he may come call on me next after Haley, right? Which I frequently do. So sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, I'll talk about this a bit more in engagement, but within, um, a case or uh, within a, a learning context, there are lots of ways where you can switch teaching methods every five to 10 or 12 minutes, whatever increment that you want to use that will keep students' attention span longer. And so, and I'll use that through, so sometimes, if, so to give a, an example, if we continue the example, I could start off with a lecture, then we could move to a poll, uh, online poll question, then we could move to a case discussion. Case discussion could go for like 30 minutes, but within that 30 minutes, there could be easily five to 10 different people that speak. So every time that happens, it's resetting the attention span. Then at the end, I may show a short four or five minute video clip, and then maybe I wrap up with the five minute comment. And that could be a 50 minute class. And so for me, what I've realized is going into a hybrid or online only teaching environment, to do that successfully, at least from what I found in my own experience, you have to have a detailed teaching. You have to be much more detailed than you normally would be. And I tend to do, uh, and that helps because um, you're much more aware of attention span, of the learner's attention span. So I, again, I, I tend to plan in 10 minute increments. Um, other people may do slightly different increments, but uh, that's what I do. And that, that helps uh, maintain the focus, both of the teacher, but as well as the learner. In that situation, I think at this point it probably goes without saying that you have to have the right equipment. Um, so, meaning you've got to have the right lighting, you've got to have microphones, right cameras, etc. I hope by this time most of your institutions have supported each of you in, in in giving you the right equipment. I mean, we've been fortunate our, our, at the business school here um, that uh, the faculty has been very supportive of trying to get us the right equipment. So, if you were to walk into my office now, I have three different devices up. Um, I have uh, lighting, different lighting up right now, um, et cetera. And so, um, you know, the right equipment is obviously key. I'm, I'm assuming that's probably straightforward uh, for everybody. 